So we already covered vectors and uh, vector spaces and subspaces. Um, I mentioned what a linear combination was. Let's make sure, or let's actually review something. Uh, so let S be a set of these guys. Uh, B I. What is a linear combination of these guys? Tell me what a linear combination of vectors in S look like. What is that? Just the other multiples of some, some or all of the vectors added to each other. Any expression of this form, um, I wouldn't really think of it as sum or all. I think of it, if you don't want someone there, make his coefficient zero is the better way to think about it. But it's an expression of this form where your ci are scales, meaning they live in your field. Okay. Right. So you can have a set of vectors and we can create what we call linear combinations of the set of vectors. And W, which is the set of all possible linear combinations, C i is in the field, and B i is in S. Set of all such things, these this is a subspace subset of S. It is a subset of your vector space V and the subspace of V, which we say it's span by S or generated by S, um, which led to the notion of span. Um, to say a set of vectors, to say S spans V means, what does it mean when I say one set spans another set? One set of vectors spans another set of vectors. The Vectors in one set can be expressed as linear combinations of the vectors in the set that spans the former. So which one? Any vector that lives where? In V. Any vector that lives in V can be expressed as a linear combination. And we had some um, nice examples. Uh, we can say, for example, that the vector i and j, we can say spans r2. Right? Any vector in here, I can express them as a linear combination of vectors in there. We say it spans r2.
So that's kind of where we left off last time. Um, so let's actually continue with this. Um, we're going to start expressing a lot more things. And we did prove a couple theorems last time. Uh, but let's see, where did we want to get? Let's actually do an example. Which I'll be, you, I think you have homework comes out like this. Determine if the following span. Here's my set S1, the vector. So by the time we get to bases, which is in 4.4, we'll sort of tie things in together. Why knowing whether something spans something or not is going to be important. Um, before that, we're going to talk about linear independence, and then it'll give us a lot of useful machinery. We'll fall out of that. But let's get through this first. How would you know? How would you go about computing whether or figuring out whether the spans are through? if like you can find somehow find like i j k within those vectors within at least one of them within each vector so they're all there i don't, I don't really know how to describe it but i see there's like a one that can in the first component that can be a way to think about it but i don't want to think about it that way because in more general settings you'll get in trouble um, here it's because you know about i j k and r three is why you can make that thing but i i want you to go more abstractly based more on the definition. You need to show that any R vector in R3 can be expressed as a linear combination of your given guys. Right. That's that's what we're going to show. Um, so that helps us to get away from any familiarity we have with the set because I don't want you locked into a certain way of thinking about these things. I want you to be a lot more general. So while rewriting things in terms of I and J could possibly work, I, I Keep away from that for the time being. So basically, to show that it spans, I just want to show that it fits this definition, meaning if I take any random vector in R3, I should be able to write it as a linear combination of vectors in here. Now, knowing that that's what I want to accomplish, how would I set that up? How would I, what would I write down? So let x, y, z in R3 be any vector. So I give this guy an, a random guy, I pick a random guy in R3, call him X, Y, Z. What, what do I write down? Uh, you want to see if uh, there exists a C1, a C2, and a C3. Such that? Such that when we take C1 times your first vector, 1, 2, 1, plus uh, your second scalar, plus second vector, plus the third. Yeah. If there are such uh, scalars that exist that give you back right here. So this is a question mark, which we don't know. We want to find if such C I exists. Right? Would I be able to write any random guy I pick as a linear combination of guys in this set? What does that mean? What would I be able to say? 
you will solve try to yeah. uh, create matrix using those vectors called okay, so these guys using matrix operations we can combine them into one big guy notice along the top row I would have C1 plus C3 well, that's a minus one minus C3, I would have 2C1 plus C2 and no C3, I would have C1, C2, and C3 gives me, as I said, right? Notice how, hey, what is that? That's a system of equations, right? I could actually write this as matrix. So ultimately, to be able to answer this question, I have to figure out, does this have a solution? Right? Which means, one way we can look at this is to just augment. There'll be other ways, but I'll, I'll mention those after. 0 minus 1, 2, 1, 0. One. Right. So the idea is we now want to solve this. So now in general, in practice, we can jump to this step. In other words, if you were faced with a question like this, does this guy span R3? What you can do is you notice that you can take each vector as they're lying and use them as columns. Boom, boom, boom. Right? Notice that it ends up being those exact same vectors, just all in a line, in order. Right? Um, and then you set that equal to any random vector. So you'll use variables here because they should be able to be arbitrary. You should be able to pick whatever you want. And you'll end up setting up this system. So if your textbook jumps from like answering this question to just there, and you realize, oh, they throw all the vectors here, that, yeah, that's what happens. Why it happens is because they went through this calculation and it ends up there. So all you have to do is arrange the vectors that you're concerned about in columns. You would think of them as your coefficient matrix, and you want to see, is it possible for the solution to exist for any arbitrary vector in the space I care about? So notice that the first column is my C1, C2, C3, and I just want to see, is this consistent for C1, C2, and C3? So you just have to get it to reduce. Uh, so reduce the, there are multiple ways you can do this. One, you can do reduce or echelon form. Uh, we already did the work, so let me tell you what we would get here. So finding the reduced echelon form, I end up with something like this. It ends up with 1, 0, minus 1. I have, I have a question. Couldn't you just get it into, not reduced row, just row echelon form? Row echelon form yeah. is fine. Um, in, in general, if I'm doing notes, I go to reduce because it's the unique. Okay. So everyone will be able to check their answer to see if they can get the same thing. Um, and by the way, this is in the case where So if you do it on your own, you'll realize you came, you'll come to a point where you have to make this choice, in which case you'll end up with this guy. And what does that line tell you? Inconsistent. It's inconsistent. Meaning there exists some vector such that this, these three vectors cannot, cannot construct that vector with a linear combination. In fact, it's going to happen when this situation is not fulfilled. So as long as your z is not equal to y minus x, it cannot actually be created. So here I'd be able to conclude, does not span Details are left to the reader. You can check that. Similarly, let's do the second one. So here, it ends up meaning we have to figure out if this guy is consistent. So I have a list of vectors I want to check 
if they span, so I'm just going to line them all up, put them as a column in a coefficient matrix, find the reducer echelon form. In this case, it reduces to something like this. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, x minus 2y over 3, x plus y over 3, x minus 5y plus 3z over 3. So this guy here actually means it's consistent. So S2 spans are. Here's something I want you to note. Um, that ASI equals the coefficient matrix. I, so I'm talking about S1, 2, and 3. Um, is there some other way you could tell me about whether the system is consistent or not? Just to determine. determine. You can look at determinants, right? By the equivalence there. You can notice that if you took the determinant of the first guy, of the coefficient matrix of the first guy, you actually got zero. You'll also notice that if you took the determinant of the, this coefficient, this matrix here, coefficient matrix of S2, you'll get something that's not zero. So there are times when you might want to solve this system. Why would you want to solve the system? If you specifically want to know exactly what the coefficients are, right? Which when we get to coordinates, you realize that there are times when we want to know specifically what these coefficients are. If I just wanted to know in general, does this set of vectors span the set, but I don't care specifically how? I can just do a determinant. And the value of the determinant is actually going to tell me. <laughs> so in this case, this one is a little tricky um, because here, when we're talking about span, we don't require like a uniqueness. I don't require that it be done in one way, but it's usually going to mean it's not consistent. Let's actually do S3. Let's see what that one would look like. So if we're doing part C, that guy would look like 1, 0, minus 1. 0, 3, 1. Immediately now you realize that this whole determinant business isn't going to work because my coefficient matrix is not square. So if sometimes I can't do the whole determinant thing even if I wanted to. In the case of where my matrix was a square matrix, I could use this as an extra um, check or maybe to just make some quick conclusions without actually getting into details. Here though, I don't have the determinant as an option because it's not a square matrix, so what I'm going to do is just have to bite the bullet and find the reduced echelon form. And this one, reduce to y minus, I, I think that's a 3, 3z three over 3, 0, 1, y over 3. And then this was 0, 0, 0. And tell me what you think would happen in this case. Is it consistent? Can I span? Two vectors always lie at a plane. Okay. So 
how would it reach the whole space if it's, if it's restricted to a plane? Okay, but how do we know that two vectors span a plane? I mean, they always lie in a plane. I don't know. I mean, you can always form a plane from two vectors. So, okay. <coughs> so you're using intuition from Calc 3 again. <laughs> that, that is true. Uh, two vectors all, also all, always span a plane. Um, but what can we say based on the re looking at the reducer echelon form? So your intuition would tell you you don't think it will span, and you'd be correct in that intuition. But I want you to, to take the linear algebra point of view instead of the geometric point of view. Yeah. Can we say there's like infinite answers? Because like the last row is 0, 0, 0. Well, you don't want to think of them as infinite technically, um, because the x, y, and z would be specific numbers, right? I just wrote them as variables because I want you to be able to choose whatever specific numbers. But the, at some point when you choose this guy, it'll be specific numbers here. It's kind of like but, a contradiction, though. I mean, you use, because if it's, let's say c1 is c2 is one, but it also has no like it doesn't have a unique value. Like, there is no unique value for for uh, C2, or if you choose C1 and pick C1, and C2 is 1 or No, two. I'm saying, let's say I picked a guy. Okay. Yeah, like uh, 1, 1, 3. Okay. Basically, then my re reduction would bring me to this situation. Where I'm plugging in 1 for x, 1 for y, and 3 for z, so that would be minus, minus 8 over 3. This would be 1 over 3, and that would be 0. Right? So you would see numbers okay. showing up here. Yeah? Um, for the third row, does that say z equals 0? Well, the third, this says 0 equals 0, which is true. Does that mean the coefficient of z always has to be 0? I'm just noticing if you plug in 0 for z in the first, in the top left, top right, then you get y over 3 and y over 3. Yeah. And they're the same, and that okay. seems like too restricted. Well, uh, it is too restrictive. That's what I want you to get at. Why is it too restrictive? How is it too restrictive? Is there anything that jumps out at you that you can see why it might be too restrictive? The third row says 0, c2 is equal to 0. The second row says c2 is equal to y over 3. Okay. And then the first one, yeah. And then I think, so that means so, that... I mean, saying c2 is equal to y over Three and saying zero c two is equal to zero, those are compatible. One doesn't contradict the other. There's no problem there. But wouldn't it put like a restriction on y, something? No, just put no restriction. If I multiply both sides by zero, I kill all the information. Y can be whatever. But it is too restrictive. Is there a way you can see that here? Something that can jump out at you to say, uh, something's... None of the coordinates depend on x? None of them depend on x, <laughs> right? You'll notice that one of your variables is completely gone. It's like the first guy, what, it didn't matter? Like, it didn't matter what I picked here? That's kind of strange that, that it worked out that way, right? Somehow I can... I have three guys that I can play with, yet you gave me an answer where only two guys are, are in play. That seems very strange. That seems very restrictive. And so... And something like this will always happen. Note here, uh, x is missing in the answer. This means there's some sort of loss of information. Meaning it's going to sort of hint to me that I can't construct everything. I won't always have all the information. Um, so can you give me a counterexample based on that? idea. Right? Is it possible to maybe pick a vector and show that it cannot be spanned? I can't construct it by these two. <coughs> because according to this, let's see what this would say. Um, so my x is 0. This 
work? Does that say that uh, no matter what choice of a three-dimensional vector you're given, that you can't get the x component at all? It's saying that the x component, the information it gives us, will be lost. So any um, so and and one way you can also interpret this is that what this is saying when you reduce the system to this level, what you're saying is that the random vector x, y, z can be expressed as this coefficient y minus 3 z over 3 times that vector plus y over 3 times the other vector. 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 3, 1. Oh, actually, you randomly pick 0, 3, 1. Let's make this up It could here. be anything, right? I'm going to show you that something's going to break, right? The fact that we're losing information for x is going to break something. So according to our reduced or echelon form, which is consistent, what would this guy be expressed as? It's going to be some coefficient times 1, 0, minus 1, plus another coefficient times 0, 3, 1. What would the, be the coefficient here? The y minus 3z over 3. y minus 3z. So that would be what? 2 minus 6. Negative which is four minus four, three. negative four over three, and plus two y over three, that's just two over three. Now the reason why I picked x equals zero is so that I can show you that the x coordinate is, can mess you up, because knowing that the first, the top, the x coordinate of this guy is one, that guy is zero, multiplying by a non-zero number is automatically going to disrupt that. Right? So the fact that this guy can't capture what's happening with the x means that you can mess up the first coordinate pretty easily. And obviously, this is not the case. Right? So we are, let me state because this is actually true in general. And you can, see, you can picture it easily in like R, R2 and R3, but I, again, I want you to think a lot more general now. So in fact, we'll make it even more general when we talk about dimension. Um, but here is something we can generalize for Rn. Um, let S be a set of vectors v1 to vr. And then, if your r is less than n, S can never span rn. You do not have enough vectors. Turns out that you need at least n vectors to span rn. If you have less vectors than the, um, the number of coordinates, you will not be able to solve for, you will not be able to span the space. You will always miss one of the coordinates, right? Because you'll, have, you'll be able to control our people, but the rest of the people, you'll lose their information. And it'll end up causing a contradiction. So this is actually a very important thing. Later on, we'll generalize this to say basically, if we have a vector space that has dimension n, then we need at least n vectors to span that space. This is just an, an, an easy, low-hanging fruit here where we can talk about Rn in this perspective. But you can kind of see it easy with Rn. So. I think I want to move on to the next section now. So this is one fact that we can, another thing. I think I mentioned this last time, but there's no harm in repeating it. Spanning sets.
are not unique. Just because you can find a spanning set doesn't mean it's the only one. There are potentially many, potentially infinitely many. In the case of Rn, there are infinitely many. Um, one thing we know that ijk spans R3, but we just showed so does S2. So there's more than one way to span a set. You don't have to be unique. It, you are required, though, in the language of later sections, to have at least as many vectors as the dimensions of the space you're, you're talking about. And right now, dimension is a very vague thing to say. You have intuition about what dimension means from Rn, but we're going to generalize it and really talk about what dimension means in a general setting. Ultimately, to that end and many other ends, we're going to start a new section. We're going to talk about linear independence. Which was mentioned on the bonus to, on the first test. Let's actually talk about what that means. Did anyone get that problem? Do you know what linear independence means? We don't know. Huh? Someone got all four bonus questions. Who wants to say it? Who thinks they know? Yeah? Linear independence means you have a set of vectors that cannot be expressed by one another, by linear combinations of the other vectors in that set. You have a set of vectors, and each vector cannot be expressed as a linear combination of the other vectors. Okay, so let let's call the let's give these set of vectors a name. Okay, so let V da, da, da. be a set of vectors in a vector space V. We say S is a linearly independent set. If, what, how would you phrase it now? The only way to get a zero vector in your space is when uh, zero vector as a linear combination of the vectors in S is when the, the corresponding Coefficients are strictly all zero, or all zero. Okay, but let's go with um, Marino's in, uh, definition first, and I'll actually show that your definition is equivalent to that. We're going to actually prove that. Um, so, how do you express it now? So, I tell you this is a set of vectors. How do I know they're linearly independent? V i in S. Yeah. If. Um, I guess. No vi in S can be expressed as a, as a linear combination uh -huh. of the other vectors in S. One way you want to think about this is linear independence assures that we do not have any redundancies. If I can create a vector using vectors that I already have, why do I need that vector? I can just create him whenever I need him. You don't need to give it to me now ahead of time. So we're cutting out all the, the excess fat, really killing all redundancies. I don't need to list a guy if I can create him with a linear combination. Because usually when I have a set of vectors, I'm going to be creating linear combinations with them anyway. So I'll eventually be able to create any one in the span of S. And so we want to get rid of redundancies. We're going to want to be minimalistic. And that's kind of where the linear independence is going to take it. And it's going to have a lot of consequences to that. Um, so... Note. And... 
I'm going to give you an equivalent because that can kind of be um, a difficult definition to work with. So we're going to give you a more mathematical definition. And this is probably the definition I'd rather you remember. This is equivalent to saying This is the zero vector of your space, whatever your vector space is, will tell you how that guy looks. But it says the only solution for the coefficients to this equation is the trivial, the trivial solution. Uh, I.e. C1 equals C2 equals equals zero, where zero is the zero scalar for the field that you have, but it's a real number. How do you prove that? So this is what linear independence means. I want uh, some way to get rid of um, redundant information. Get rid of information that I can create on my own anyway. Um, and I claim that this requirement, requiring that this equation has only the trivial solution for the coefficients, is enough. I don't have to check anything else. How do you go about proving that? Do you suppose that there's more than one way? What do you mean, suppose there's more than one way? Uh, wait, we're trying to prove that this is the only way? Wait, what are we proving exactly? that these two requirements are the same. Me saying, I don't want any one vector to be <coughs> expressible as a linear combination of the other vectors is the same as me saying, okay. this equation must only have this solution. Okay. That's an implication of both directions. So yeah, sure. Uh, start with one. Let's start with the linear combination definition. The node. Okay, and then where would you go from there? So, assume that the only solution for an equation of that form is the trivial solution. Mm -hmm. And then, what would that mean? That would mean. Wait, so we're trying to get from there to that. Wait, can I see? So we do induction because we're talking about the infinite uh, sum of vectors. And yes. Can you say that uh, if that is true? Let's show that. Uh, let's let's show that the definition implies. You can actually call that a theorem. So it's a theorem. If v1 through vn are linearly independent, then this equation will only have that solution. Um, so prove that if that is true, then this must be true. That's probably the easier way. I guess we first have to set vi not equal to v0 to vi minus 1. I mean, the linear combination of c. Uh, yeah, but that's, that's not true for any vector. Yeah. OK. So do we start off by saying um, 
supposedly S is a linearly independent. Yeah, so I'm saying if S is linear independent, that because that no VI can be expressed as a linear combination of the others, then the only solution to this must be that. Then here's, I'll start here over this direction. Assume, it's probably the easiest way to prove it, assume to the contrary. So, which means I'm going to do a proof by contradiction. So, what would I be assuming here? You would be assuming that this is true, but that is that not is true. Okay? What does it mean for this to be false? That means that the solution is not the trivial solution. Meaning we have solutions other than the trivial solution. Okay. Right. Def it's a homogeneous system, so there's definitely a solution. So I don't have to consider the case that is inconsistent, right? Because mm -hmm. I can simply pick all scalars equal zero, and I'll get the zero vector because zero times a vector is the zero vector by, we have another theorem that tells us that. So it definitely has a solution. So for this to be false, it means it has solutions other than the trivial solution. So this means, assume to the contrary, then what that means is there is some non-trivial solution. To equation one, let me call this equation one. Say, without loss of generality, right? So basically, what I'm saying is the trivial solution means everyone has to be zero. So, the having a non-trivial solution means at least one of them is not zero, right? So I'm just going to do because it's not going to really matter. It'll be very similar no matter who I pick. Assume without loss of generality that my C one is not zero, right? So I have a non-trivial solution where my first coefficient is not zero. What would I be able to say in that case? Then you can add all the other vectors to the other side. Then I can move all the vectors to the other side. Solving for C1, that C1, B1. This means that I have C1, B1 would be equal to minus C2, B2, minus, da, 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 minus C, N, B, N, and what would that say? That's a linear combination. But well, almost. The thing is, C1 is not 0, so I can divide by it. Right. So this means V1 would be minus C2 over C1, V2, minus dot, 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 minus Cn over C1, Vn, which these are, this is a real number divided by a non-zero thing, so it, it, co it comes down to some other real number. Let's call it a2, b2, plus a, plus a, n, v, n. So v1 is expressible as a linear combination of the others. saying that the theorem what about saying that this theorem implies definition meaning if setting up that equation only has a trivial solution it will imply that no vector is expressible as a linear combination of the other vectors how do you prove that direction saying, assuming C1, V1 plus da da da, C N, V N equals zero has only the trivial solution implies that no V I is a linear combo of the others. Do 
positive? Contrapositive? So, uh, let's see. Assume, without loss of generality, right, that V1 is a linear combo where I can say V1 will be equal to something like C2 V2 plus C3 V3 plus Cn Vn. Right? So I'm assuming I can write something as a linear combination. Without loss of generality, let's say V1 is expressible as a linear combination. What would I then be able to say? Side. Move everything to one side, I would have V1. Well, just to make it look pretty, let's look at these guys to look negative. V2 plus Cn Vn would be equal to the zero vector, which gives us a non trivial solution. Because here I have 1 times V1 plus all those guys. I can literally just choose them all to be zero. And so this gives a non-trivial solution. Right? So not all the CIs have to be zero. C1 can, in fact, be one. Right? How would this be done directly? Is there a nice way? Uh, to say that that has only the trivial solution to start here and then get there. Uh, is there a nice way to do it directly? There's a way to do it by contradiction. It will be pretty Ooh, similar. similar. But uh, to go directly from that to... Yeah, I'm not sure. That'll be hard to say. It's hard to say without appealing to some negation. So I'll probably want to start there and then say something like, oh, I can't divide in the end because that would be division by zero or something like that. It, it, it'll be kind of weird. I think the contrapositive or contradiction is a nice way to go. Okay. So from now on, this is our definition. Of course, you can think about what it means, but I want you to take this as a definition. So S equals V1 through Vn is called linearly independent if and only if the only solution to C1, V1, plus dot, 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 C, N, B, N equals zero is C1 equals C2 equals C equals zero. And again, we're dealing with real vector spaces here, so the zero here is the zero from the real numbers, but it can be from whatever field you're talking about. And the zero vector here is also arbitrary. It might not look like R in or anything there, so just be aware of that. So that's our definition. And once this is fulfilled, it means that our set is minimalistic in the sense that I need everyone. If, you, if I lose somebody, I, ought to, I can't recreate them from the other people, right? So it means everyone is important, right? They're all special. We all need all of them. Right? Whenever you have one guy that you can do without, it's not linearly independent. Right? I don't need him because I can just create him at will whenever I need it. Right? So, um, some more terminology. So that's called linearly dependent. If S is not linearly independent, it is called linearly dependent. So 
that's the opposite of linearly independent. You don't say it's non-linearly independent. You say it's linearly dependent. Right? Just drop the E. Um, we can also say, in this case, so if S is a linearly independent set, I can describe this relationship between any two vectors in the set. So I can say V1 is linearly independent to V3. It'll also, I, it's also okay for me to make that kind of statement. So I can talk about a set being linearly independent, but I can also talk about individual vectors in that set being linearly independent to each other. And we won't consider that a, an abuse of language. So you have a, if you have a linear independent set and you throw away some of the guys, sure, you'll lose some information, but you won't lose linear independence. <coughs> Being able to, knowing that is useful in things like the plus minus theorem, which we'll talk about in a couple sections. We're going to want to, the freedom to be able to throw away vectors and add vectors to trim it to a size that we require. So I'm saying, what I'm saying is if you have a set of linearly independent vectors, you can throw the vectors at will, and as long as you have a non-empty set, it will remain linearly independent. You don't have to worry about losing independence by throwing away vectors. Proof. Assume that the set S is linearly independent. Mm -hmm then for all vi in S, um, for all vi in S, vi is linearly independent to vj. Mm -hmm. Throw away some arbitrary amount of vectors. And since and have a new set. T. Right? That comes out for us. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Can't remember, <say. laughs> Can't remember the alphabet. Um, let, so let's actually call that. Let T be the non empty subset. Okay. So we throw away some arbitrary um, vectors in S to create a set T, and then what are we going to say about T? For any vi in T, it is also an S. Mm -hmm. Same thing for any other vector that we can choose. Um, but I guess that assumes that T has at least two vectors. Well, no, it, yeah. it'll work for one as well. Okay. Um, but the, any two vectors that you choose in T will be linearly independent to one another because in S they were linearly independent. Yeah, so if you take any two random vectors in S, they're linearly independent to each other. Therefore, if those two vectors happen to be in T, they'll also be linearly independent. Um, another way you can say it is, so that, that can work. You could use that argument. Um, to use our definition, there's a way we can invoke the definition here, which is, uh, I'll show you that technique because I think that's preferable. But what you said is fine. Um, 
but um, say t is equal to So I create another set of guys that I, I took them from S. I just renamed them because I want to number them in the order that I took them for whatever reason, just for aesthetic reasons. Okay. So now, how would I show that they have to be linearly independent by the definition? How would I show that if I create that equation, that it will only have the trivial solution? Wait, are we trying to say... Uh... The zero vectors are going to be different for both, right? Because you're reducing the no. space, right? No, the zero vector would be the same. Well, to get that, you need to get... I'm saying that what you're trying to prove is uh, the only way to get the zero vector is if all the, the scalars are non -zero, uh, equal to zero. Yes. So the zero That's vector... That's what I'm saying, yeah. So that one would be different from there? That zero vector? No, the zero vector would be the same. Remember, S is a set of vectors that lie in a vector space. The zero vector comes from the vector space. Oh, okay. okay. Right? So this is a subset of some vector space. It has its zero. And T is a subset of this guy, which means it's ultimately also the subset of some other vector space, which has its zero. Oh, so, so it's the that, same vector space. Okay. So it's the same zero. So this would be the zero in vector space of okay. V, okay. Where, where S is a subset of V. And ultimately, T is a subset of S, which is also a subset of V. Right. So this guy is the vector space. S is just a finite set of vectors that I chose from the vector space. And then T is a non-empty subset of that. I have a question. Can we assume that the T, like, by definition, can we say T is a, uh, like a, a subspace or no? Can I say that by... I can say the set of all linear combinations of T is a subspace. Okay. In fact, if we have a linearly independent set, um, if I only take those vectors by themselves, I know for sure it's not a subspace. We'll prove a theorem that, that can, is why we're going to say. Basically, zero cannot be a member of a linearly independent set, is the upshot of that. And if something doesn't contain a zero vector, it does, it's not a vector space. Okay. Um, but let's actually do that. So let's consider this equation. How do I know that it will only have the trivial solution? Because the other one will be strictly zero. Sure, this is in everybody. It's a subset of... Well, I mean, but the C1s from over there come from there? No, C1s are in the arbitrary C1s. Because the vectors that you got were vectors from S and no vector in S is a linear combination of the others. Okay. That implies that no vector in B is a linear combination of the others. And because the definition implies uh, the definition earlier, when we had definition in theorem, mm -hmm. um, the definition the implies that uh, the theorem... Yeah, but then you have to plug in like linear combinations then. Do we? Wait, I don't get this. Wait, so then... I'm just saying that... I want to show that this will have only the trivial solution. I will know for sure that the CI through the CR will have to all be zero. Okay. Wait, so... How can I show that will have to all be zero? Wait, but if that S, right, it's supposed that thing is strictly zero, all the things, right? Right, I do know, for example, that A1, V1, plus all the way down to A, N, V, N, equals zero implies that all the a's are zero. I know this. But then I'm not taking everybody. I'm taking just a few people. Okay. Um, right? So, so there, I, I basically, I'm splitting this guy into two groups. There are the guys that I put in T, which I can, I just rename them for convenience, call the C1, B1, plus C2, B2, plus there's R of those guys, plus 
there are the guys that are left over. Right, so we can call these guys D1, A1 plus, this will go up to D, N minus R, A, N minus R. Right, so that's the situation. But I'm saying, I know all together it gives me zero, meaning I would only get the trivial solution. But what if I only look at a subset of this guy? I only pick a part of it. Okay. How do I know if I set that one piece equal to zero, that it also only has the trivial solution? Yeah, so you're looking at a smaller zero vector is what I'm saying. Right. No, the zero vector is the same zero vector in all cases. But even if you lose vectors in your S set, but you're still able to span the same size zero vector? Yeah. Because I can always just choose the coefficients equals zero to get the zero vector. Getting the zero vector is not a problem. And the zero vector is unique, so there's no more than one zeros at any okay. given time. But my point is, if I only take a few of these guys and throw them in their own equation and set up this equation, it also has the trivial solution. Could you do t plus uh, the other one equals the zero factor? And because you know, like t, t plus the other stuff. stuff. Yeah. And, but you know that the coefficients in the other stuff are zero, meaning... I don't know, I don't know a priori that all of these have to be zero or that all of these have to be zero on their own. I know that when I take them all together, they'll, they'll all have to be okay, zero. But how do I know that, oh, if I only take a few of them, it still has the requirement that all the coefficients okay. have to be zero. Oh, can oh, you move so things on the other side? What other side? There's zero over here. Yeah, but and by the way, now when I took my subset T, these guys are not considered anymore. They were in S. They're not in the part of S that I choose. Now I'm, I'm only worried about these. So these guys kind of don't matter right now, but I can, I can use them. Ultimately, I want to start here and ultimately show that it has to still work. Assume a non trivial solution exists. Say C1 is not C1. Right? So I'm, this is non trivial solution to, I don't want you to mix up equations here. So I'm going to call this equation 2. Assume it has a non-trivial solution. For example, let's say the first coefficient, without loss of generality, is non-zero. Then, why is that a problem? Because, like earlier with our proof by contradiction, we'll end up expressing v v1 in t as a linear combination of the others, but... Yeah, so I'll, I'll be able to say B1 plus... Let's look at all the other guys that are left over. Oh, then... Right? Then if I add all these other guys, these are uh, C2B2 plus da da da, CRBR plus uh, A1 D1, A1, plus da da da, Dn minus R, An minus R. Right, these here are all the other guys in B. Other guys in S. This means we have a non-trivial solution for the vectors in S. That's a contradiction, because that means the original set was not independent. So if I have a linear independent set, I can arbitrarily throw away vectors, and the, what's left over will remain independent.
Here are some other useful facts. set that contains zero is dependent. B. So a linear independent set cannot contain zero. A set with one vector is linearly independent if and only if that vector is not the zero vector. A set with two elements in particular is linearly independent if <coughs> V1 is not a multiple of V2. Of course, and vice versa. So just uh, create a uh, yeah. Let's create a set. Yeah. Uh, that B equals the set with zero v one to v n. Right. Yeah. And then uh, create a linear combination. So yeah. Uh, uh, C one times zero factor plus you know that yeah that that C one v one. So C two B two plus C three B three plus da da da. Right. Um, C N B N equals zero. Okay, and then you just assign Z C one any arbitrary value, value, right? Yeah. So let's assign C one to be the value one. Assign all of these to be the value zero. Then this shows a non-trivial solution. Okay. So if you contain the zero vector, you cannot be independent. Which automatically is, means that any set of linearly independent vectors cannot on its own be a vector space. It can't be a subspace of the space we're talking about because it won't have the zero vector. So it will fail axiom four. Um, let B equals B1. So I need to show that it's linearly independent if and only if it's not zero. So I can do the cases. B1 is the zero vector versus B1 is not the zero vector. Um, in this case, 
1 times v1 equals 0 is a non-trivial solution. This means not independent. Um, how do you deal with this case? Set C1, V1 equals 0. But assume to the contrary, there's some non-zero solution. Then I would be able to write V1 equals 1 over C1 times the zero vector. We have a theorem that tells us that is the zero vector, but we assumed it was not the zero vector. Part C. If I only have two vectors, then as long as one is not a multiple of the other, they are linearly independent. So C. Assume V1 is a multiple of V2. By the way, we know it has to be a non-zero multiple because of, um, well, parts A and Actually, B. I have a quick question for B. Yeah. For, the, for the second case, I mean, couldn't you not, you didn't have to prove it by the contradiction, you could just prove it outright because the same theorem says, you know, a, a, a scalar times a non-zero vector uh, it is equal to zero. It, if uh, C1 is 0, V1 right. is 0, that yeah. theorem? Yeah, you could use that. Okay. That's fine. Sure. Right. That's a prior. We did that a couple of classes ago. Okay. But yeah. Um, uh, we know by part uh, A, uh, K cannot be 0, right? Because that will give us a 0 vector, which we know is not going to work. Right? So V1 is some non-zero scalar multiple of V2. Right? Then it means I can just say, um, what can I say? I can just say minus 1 over KV1 plus KV2. Right? That would give me minus 1 over K times kv2 plus v2, that would actually give me the zero vector, is a non-trivial solution. Professor? Yes. Sure. You're doing that by the couch positive, right? See? Oh, what I just wrote here That's proof was proof. I showed that I'm proving in that direction oh, yeah, I'm sorry. using the contrapositive. Okay, yeah. so, so then a question about that. So I'm saying, assuming it is a multiple, then it has to be dependent. So could we also like, subtract v1 from both sides and get the zero vector equal to minus 1 v1 kv2? That would also hold in. Okay. Right, because once I say k is not zero, I could also just bring this over. So I have minus 1v1, which, again, if you multiply into both sides here by k, you get exactly that equation. Um, but you'll get a non-trivial solution. Right. Um, <coughs> how do you do the converse? So I know uh, V1 and V2 is linearly independent, it implies that one is not a multiple of the other. Oh, wait, that's what that's what I did. <laughs> um, so now we want to go that way. But the contraposite. Okay. By the contrapositive, assume 
S is dependent then there is a non-zero solution to C1 V1 plus C2 V2 equals the zero vector say and I mean without loss of generality, your C1 is not zero, then that would mean I can write my V1 as minus C2 over C1 times V2. And so I get that it is a multiple in this instance. Okay. small theorem and we'll stop there but we're not going to, I'll give you some more concrete examples next time as well as talk about the Ronskian that some of you would have seen in differential equations talk about where that comes from basically the Ronskian comes from setting up this sort of equation and then using a matrices to solve it as a system. And you end up with the wrong system. Here's another theorem. Very important. Let S equals B1. And again, we're going to see a generalization of this. Um, later to the R. B vectors in Rn. Then if um, R is bigger than N, then S is dependent. Let's say I go into R3 and I pick four random vectors. Pick any set of vectors that is higher than three. It turns out I will guarantee to have a dependent set. So the generalization of this is if you have more vectors than the dimensions of your vector space, that set will be linearly dependent. But we'll talk about what dimensions are later on. Let's illustrate with R3. It's not going to be hard to generalize. I just want to write things out without ellipses and stuff. Um, so take, say, <coughs> s equals, I didn't even do it with r2. I already locked myself in. Um, Let's say I take a set of four vectors. By, by me constructing this, you'll, you'll see how you can do it in general um, with a lot of ellipses. Um, so this guy, let's actually call it something like x1, y1, y1. <coughs> this guy is called x2, y2, z2. This guy, x3, y3, z3. It can be arbitrary because any, any four you pick is, is going to work. x4, y4. That for then set basically I'm going to solve the equation to be look like the zero vector, right? So remember, if I take c1 times equals c2 times equals c2 that that equals zero, it's going to end up being me putting these vectors one after the other in the coefficient matrix. Okay. 
and what can you tell me about that? Basically, what do I want to say here? You want to see that there's a, like a, a parameter for you, right? Right. It will be independent if there's a unique solution, in other words, right? Which would be the trivial solution. So as long as I can show that this, is, this will not give me a unique solution, we're done. The thing is, I can use determinants to help me, it's not square. But what argument can I use? How do I know that this will not have a unique solution? That you can have at max three pivots. You'll have at max three pivots. There are only three rows. And you'll only, you can only have one row per pivot. So you can have at most three pivots, but there are four variables to cover, which means you would have at least one parameter, which means you would automatically have an infinite number of solutions. And after solving tons of systems using matrices, you will have that intuition. Oh, I didn't. I have four columns and three rows, there's going to be an extra depth. There's going to be parameters here. So as long as it's consistent, which I know it's consistent because it's a homogeneous system and we had that theorem that it's always consistent. Um, at the very minimum, there's a trivial solution, but there might be more. So I know it's consistent. And so now, um, since it has most pivots, which means there is at least one parameter. meaning infinite solutions. Meaning non-trivial solutions to C1, B1 plus C2, B2, C4, B4 equals <coughs> 0. So it turns out it'll be dependent. It doesn't matter what vectors you give me. If we're in R3 and you give me four vectors, it's not going to work out. Right, and I said, like I said, we're going to generalize this um, in the future. Um, but one reason, another reason why I like to go through the Rn examples is that eventually we're going to be able to say that if we have a finite dimensional vector space, it is equivalent to some vector space in Rn. So what I know works in Rn is going to work in that vector space. So it's nice for you to be able to see it, how it works out in Rn, because a lot of that will give you intuition for how it works out in much more general spaces that might not be Rn. Um, we will stop there, because a little bit of over six minutes ago. I want to do back the test and maybe mention some things. So I post the solutions and I, I, I think I uploaded your grades to Jupyter already and I emailed, I sent a mass email talking about stuff. So be sure that you get that. So just note. Do your report card to Jupyter. Read. Read email I sent today. Um, in terms of your grade, it'll be written in a format where you may or may not see two numbers. So you might see something like a 72 and plus a 3. Um, so whenever you see that, what that means is your grade is actually a 75. But I'm isolating what points you got from the bonus versus what points you got from the test without the bonus. Right? And if this grade, if without the bonus, you got less than 70, you must see me. The sooner the better, probably. If you're not sure if you want to drop the course or not, you should see me before end of day Thursday because that's the last day to draw class. So in general, I would be free now. So I'll probably have people from my previous class coming to see me. And you guys can wait if you want. But if not, we can meet.
a bit later in the day or on Thursday after 3. If you're sure you're, you'll stay in the class no matter what, then you can put it off till next week, but don't push it further than next week. Um, so you should talk about some stuff. I was going to talk about some of the common mistakes I um, in the mood right now. Maybe I'll talk about that next time. I wanted to point out some specific mistakes because, especially since this class isn't a proofs class, I figured I'd actually get a lot more specific with the mistakes I made, as opposed to my other class where I could just tell them, oh, you guys did this. I probably, probably want to show you guys a little bit. Um, so that being said, let me give you your test back, and then you can stick around if you want to meet with me, or you can leave.